So thank you everyone for joining. I know it's late. I know it's also late in UK. So without any further ado, let's start to this session. Um, so youth inclusive responsive policy. Um, to this session, we'll look into um, the advocacy angle, the entry points in achieving SDGs in Bangladesh. And we'll present three uh, specific case from three youth speakers who has joined us today. And the main idea of the session is to start a discussion point uh, between participants in Bangladesh and participants abroad uh, to figure out um, different entry points, as I mentioned, to um, solve different challenges. Um, so next slide, please. So um, as you know, uh, we have nine years left to meet the agenda 2030 targets. And interestingly, by 2030 alone, the 1.9 billion young people around the world are projected to turn 15 years old. That's a huge number. And the youth are going to carry the burden. And the future is in terms of achieving different areas in the climate sector or the water sector, whichever sector you talk about. They are the forerunners of that particular year. So 90% of the youth are currently um, residing in the developing countries. And unfortunately, unfortunately, um, in terms of climate action and climate change, they're going to face the brunt of it. The reason I'm saying fortunately is because we're still hopeful. Uh, this youth have the power to bring about changes in their respective countries. And with a little bit of help from all the experts present in this conference, maybe it's a way forward they can take and figure out how to um, solve those challenges. So next slide. So to give you an overview of the SDGs in Bangladesh, so I want to, you to focus on three specific SDGs we're going to talk about today. So for SDG 13, climate action, um, as you can see from the slides, uh, we have somewhat achieved the targets for Bangladesh. But coincidentally, um, for SDG 5 and SDG 6, significant challenges are still remaining in achieving those particular targets. And regardless of achieving um, SDG 13 for climate action, um, as you are all aware, climate change is uh, changing uh, every year as, with multiple problems coming up. So it has a numerous cross-cutting uh, problems that are created in those other SDGs. So all SDGs are um, must work in cohesion in order to, for us to achieve those particular targets. So well, next slide. So, to give you a context for Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh currently ranks seventh uh, on the vulnerability index and over 4 million people lack access to basic water and sanitation. So 2000 children, for example, die every year um, due to diarrhea. And unfortunately, also in the different hotspots of coastal belts of Bangladesh, women and girls are carrying the burden of these uh, unforgiving changes. So as I mentioned earlier, SDG 6, SDG 5, and SDG 13 must work together because climate impacts have a significant ripple effect for the water and sanitation in Bangladesh. At the same time, it as I mentioned earlier, it has a huge impact on the women and adolescent girls in Bangladesh. So with that in mind, we have invited three youth speakers who would be presenting three unique case studies. But before that, I would like to welcome my colleague from ICA, Jennifer Kazim, um, to run you through the session objectives and give you an overview of our youth um, programs we run from WaterAid and ICA. Um, Jennifer? Thank you, Adnan. Hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, Shohel, uh, I think we should go to the next slide. So, as Adnan mentioned, um, sorry, I'm not using the video option because my internet is very unstable here. Um, so the aim of this session is to highlight um, whatever learning we have from the climate change sector, especially in terms of the challenges that youth uh, face 
and what could be the possible solution to the existing problems and also at the same time uh, the uh, new emerging problems that will come in the future. So um, this session is actually aimed at um, SDGs and we will talk about the three SDGs as Adnan mentioned, uh, but we have to find a holistic uh, approach in finding the answer. And, and as we know that youth are more uh, interested into the activism part and in advocacy. So what we aim to look at is how youth can be included in different parts of the decision-making process. And in this case, um, by the decision-making process, we mean to say from the local level at the community level and to the policy process of the country. So from local to national and to the global level. So we are not leaving anyone behind. We are taking into consideration everyone's opinion and uh, what they want to see <clears throat> change in terms of climate change. So at the same time, uh, we're thinking about what innovative solutions could be um, generated. So if we give youth the opportunity to showcase uh, whatever they want to do, um, I think there is a big uh, platform uh, for the youth these days, especially um, sectors who are working in the climate change uh, area. Uh, for example, um, NGOs such as WaterAid and academic uh, and research institutions like ours, ECAT. Um, what, are the challenge, what are the challenges that remains in terms of innovating the solution, uh, whether they're not getting any fund or whether or not they're not getting any opportunities. Those are, the, uh, those are some of the points that we want to talk about today. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So at the same time, what we can learn from each other, and this can happen from local youth for example, youth in the coastal area and youth in the northern area, they could, what they can learn from each other. And also youth in the urban areas, such as Taka and Chittagong in Russia, and what they can learn from each other. And at the same time, when we talk about the global level, can we learn something from the um, cross-cutting issues um, and how youth are uh, changing the face of climate change uh, problems in different LDC countries and in the global north? Um, and that's what we aim to do in this session. Um, Shohal, next slide. So as Adnan mentioned, we have three really bright uh, young uh, speaker, uh, speakers today, and they're, um, they will focus on the three different SDG, SDG 6, SDG 5, and SDG 13. And the first, um, um, participants uh, will be from, <coughs> excuse me, from the, uh, sorry, Adnan. Um, yeah, so the participants will be from three different streams of the training program. For example, from the Youth Climate Lab, we have one speaker. From the Water Aids, Water and Climate Youth Advocate Training Program, we have another advocate will be, um, soon we will introduce them to you. And lastly, we have another training program. It's called Jaukona. It's the first ever women's only training program in Bangladesh, focusing on um, empowering STEM students on climate and wash is issues. So without any further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker. Um, so next slide, please. Um, Zari Foyshek, thank you for joining us. Um, so uh, Mr. Zarif will speak about SDG 6 and his project, and you, he will share a short video while he's presenting. So without any further ado, Zarif, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to introduce myself. I am Zarif Oishik. I have completed my graduation in urban and rural planning from Kulna University. Uh, Kulna is the third largest city in Bangladesh, by the way. So besides my planning profession, I am a youth advocate of Water Aid, which has brought me here today in this session. And I'll be talking about SDC 6. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I expect you have heard that Dhaka, has, Dhaka city has many slums, right? In the maps, you can show the cluster of the slums. Uh, 
to be more specific dhaka city has more than 5000 slums which is almost 30 percent of the total population in here youth collects water for their household from a uh, common source or a shared source as only 8.1 percent of slum households has piped connections this statistic stands for less water supply right next slide please And we know that less water supply means less collection. Less collection results in no self hygiene, no sanitation, especially for the youth, which leads to adolescent disease. And of course, there is long queue. Long queue means no time for education. In, in general, young girl gets harassed in these long queues. So question will arise at this point that uh, how less is the supply? Next slide, please. Well, 30% of the slum population have access to water supply of water supply and sewage authority. In short, WASA, a Bangladesh government agency responsible for water and sewage in Bangladesh. So only 30% has the access. So do you think this is shocking? Let me share another statistics with you. Slum dwellers pay 30 to 80 taka per thousand liters where meter connections cost only 6.34 per thousand liters surely there's something wrong next slide please uh, are we saying that dhaka has less water in this case i have a video to show you kindly next slide and play the video please in the urban area Leakage in taps is common. It may occur that what could a drop make difference? Let's find out. If we consider a single drop per second from a leaking tap, in one hour it will be 1.69 liters. Eventually, 13.50 liters during the idlest time of the day, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. or in eight hours. If two toilets have the same problems of leak tap, then it is almost 27 liters of water in just one night from a single flat. So, three flats will produce 81 liters of water from the leaking tap. According to the World Health Organization, between 50 and 100 liters of water per person per day are needed to ensure that most basic needs are met and few health concerns arise. Three flats in Dhaka City are wasting the same amount of water in just one night, by which a person can meet his or her daily needs. Just imagine how many flats in Dhaka City have a tap leakage problem, and for how many years it is continuing. If we fix the problematic taps or tighten them after every use, it won't take more than five minutes. This simple act is saving much more water than we can't even imagine. SDG 6 is targeting to ensure the availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation by 2030. But, Professor Benjamin Sobakul from Aarhus University said, there will be no water by 2040 if we keep doing what we're doing today. So we have to act quickly and as they say, charity begins at home. In this scenario, stop water wastage at home. Fixing the leaking tap would be a great start. By doing this, we can play our part in fulfilling the target of SDG 6.4 which is, by 2030, substantially increase water use efficiency across all sectors and ensure sustainable withdrawals and supply of freshwater to address water scarcity and substantially reduce the number of people suffering from water scarcity. Water scarcity will rise if water wastage is not prevented. Our youth has a vital role to play in the coming days to build a better world, to contribute to the noble cause of SDG 6. But there are always challenges while doing greater things. What are these challenges and how can we overcome them? So I have made this video after I noticed the problem and the numbers in it. The message of the video is quite simple. There is a vast amount of water wastage without even our realization. And we often talk about the solutions, but there are many barriers in implementing simple solutions, such as lack of education, uh, 
trust and obviously there is a lack of platforms and there are many more so can you help us figure it out in this point i i am giving the floor to the next youth advocate thank you so much thank you zarif so before we go into um, our next speaker i just want to summarize that there are multiple issues related to water in bangladesh um, different parts of bangladesh have different water issues for example the coastal belt we're struggling with salinity intrusion due to sea level rise. At the same time, in the northern parts of Bangladesh, there are problems of drought. So we, as a nation, are facing different water crises in different areas. And as you see that even though there are youths who are trying to solve different problems, there are challenges. How do you solve challenges in slum areas, right? So um, Zarif came up with this idea about solving the water crisis in the urban areas, but there are different challenges. And for the feedback session, for the um, discussion session, we would like to hear your um, ideas. Hence, can you help us figure it out? On maybe you have different solutions in your country which we can implement in Bangladesh. So without any further ado, we'd like to invite our next speaker. Um, next slide, please. So um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Joy Chakma. Um, she'll be presenting on her work as a youth um, activist, and she will speak on SDG5. Joy, um, whenever you're ready. Juju vet kumare monangan Joy HACB 15 conference out for the how at the farina mor bosuman go matusilat. So hello everyone. I'm Joy Chakma. My pronouns are she and her. And my identity is I belong to Chakma Influence Community. And I am also a graduated Jalkuna trainee. I'm working as an intern at Watery. And I'm studying in chemical engineering at Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. And I'm one of the founding members of Beyond the Hills. Next slide, please. So, Beyond the Hills, basically, Beyond the Hills is a nonprofit initiative to promote, preserve, and mainstream rich and diverse knowledge culture of indigenous communities. There are 54 indigenous communities in Bangladesh who live in hill areas, which is known as Choctogram Hill Tracks and in plain lands. There is a thought that circulates in our country that indigenous communities live only in hill tracks. And for these reasons, for these reasons, we have created Beyond the Hills that we want to tell others that indigenous communities live beyond the hills. And our aim is not to leave anyone behind and give importance to the welfare of the indigenous communities in Bangladesh. Next slide, please. So for now, let's take you all to Chotogram Hill Tracks, where I grew up as an indigenous individual. So Chotogram Hill Tracks is the only extensive hilly area in the country and home to the one third of the total indigenous population. It consists of three districts that are Rangamati, Khagrachuri, and Bandogon. Among 54, 11 indigenous communities live in hill tracts. In Chittagong hill tracts, the customary laws and the unique law systems are managed by both traditional and the state traditions protected by constitutions. Back when Chittagong hill tracts was ruled by the British colonizers, the 1900 regulation was the most important legal instrument which has now corrected several times by the government. But now CHT Accord is the most important than 19 regulation. According to the World Bank report, in Chittagong Hill Tracks, the poverty rate is 65%, whereas the national poverty rate is 23. And the indigenous people often face difficulties such as unemployment, education, lack of health and infrastructure. And another thing, added to the list is climate change. Next slide, please. As Chittagong, as climate change has hit all over in Bangladesh, it can be said CHT has become a hotspot for climate change and the indigenous people are closest to the environment. So they are the forefront of the risk of climate change. Their heritage, livelihood and food supply are almost everything depend on nature and land. Because of climate change, the, the temperature has risen up. And for this reason, water crisis has become more severe than ever. And for this, there is a possibility more conflicts can occur in this region. 
The whole ecosystem has broken down. The water system, the water streams are drying up. Besides the natural causes, there are some man-made devastations, such as illegal stone extractions. That has not only put an, put an end to the biodiversity, but also causes problems to the food supplies of the indigenous communities. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. As climate change is affecting mostly on water resources, wash management is becoming more and more hard for the indigenous people. And to, be import to give importance, indigenous women are becoming more and more vulnerable because of this wash management systems and they become more vulnerable when they menstruate. So the SDG five is not getting fulfilled because of menstruation hygiene management, mismanagement and the boundary effects. The menstruation, the menstrual hygiene management is not happening in safe and convenient manner, manner due to lack of water. Indigenous women of all ages, especially youth and adolescent girls are in living risk because of the lackings of awareness and information about menstruation. In inadequate access, lack of transportation, lack of roads. Into this region, NGO interventions are seemingly very low and not sustainable in the long run. So the targets, next slide please. So from the SDG five, the targets I'm really trying to say is the targets that are not getting fulfilled are five point two because the menstruation is often labeled as a taboo, and for this re for this reason, the indigenous women get exploited physically and mentally. The target five point five inaccessibility of reproductive rights and health. Indigenous women of all ages become vulnerable to reproductive health issues. The target 5.6, the menstruation is holding back indigenous women to fully flourish than the main counterparts for which being non-active in decision-making and leadership. Next slide, please. Okay. As we can see, there are many things to consider and think to let SDG 5 getting fulfilled in Chittagong Hildreth. So I want you all to not work for us, but work with us and stand with us indigenous communities through your suggestions and help and let us achieve SDG 5 in Chittagong Hilltrends. I want to say thank you all for listening to me patiently till now. Thank you, Joey. Um, excellent insight. Um, and thank you for representing. Um, it's really important uh, when we're talking about inclusive representation. I, we want to share the idea and the statement that everyone should be included when we're targeting in achieving um, SDGs and for the greater part of climate action. So without any further ado, I'd like to invite our third speaker. Um, she'll be talking about SDG 13 and the importance of inclusive of SDG 5 and SDG 6 as well. So um, Anika, without any further ado, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adnan Bhai. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is well. Um, I am Tavia Tasni Manika. Uh, I have completed my graduation in forestry and environmental science from Shah Jalal University of Science and Technology. I'm also a youth advocate and climate um, volunteer and currently working as youth climate lab program associate, which is a program based on youth activities in different type of climate action. Uh, next slide, please. So for my study purpose, I have been uh, living in CLED for last five years. And uh, as a youth advocate, I am uh, currently working um, with our people, with our youth uh, in Chunamganj district, which is beside Silet district. So let me first describe something about uh, what our areas uh, are, what are their geographical characteristics. Howers are unique wetland and it is highly rich with its biodiversity. Uh, Howers basins are large bowl shaped depressions and these 80% of our areas are located in the northeastern part of Bangladesh. So 
uh, house are basically surrounded by Indian hill range like Asham, Tripura, Mizoram, etc. And what happens in the monsoon? Extreme pre precipitation occurs in Indian hill range and uh, how basins receive a huge amount of water directly coming from the upland. And then the flash flood hits Shunamganj, the flash flood hits our area. So flash flood and pre-monsoon flood are the two major climatic problems in Howard region that the people of Howard face every year. And the frequency of flash flood and pre-monsoon flood is increasing year by year. Next slide, please. Okay. So um, what, it, during flash flood or pre-monsoon flood, uh, the women and the youth of our people face a lot of problem. Problems like the first one that in my observation is skin disease like uh, fungal attack or rashes. They are very common among children and other women. And the second problem is waterborne disease like cholera, diarrhea, food poisoning, typhoid, etc. This type of waterborne disease outbreak like an epidemic in this time or time period. So the second problem I observed in our area is lack of drinking water, which is a very big problem there. Uh, as water level rises when the flood comes, the water also uh, come into their houses. So all the tube oils in our region get submerged during flood and there happens the lack of drinking water. Uh, talking about youths in how region, they generally migrate from the affected area as um, when flood attacks, Flood water re, uh, stays for seven to eight months long. So they must find a job to support the family as there is nothing to do for them in the house uh, for like six to eight months long. This is the reason behind dropping out from education, which is very common in our villages. Uh, they drop out from education in very young age. Young uh, girls are forced to marriage and boys usually move to big cities or it seems that uh, they are helping their fathers in fishing in a boat. So these, these, all, uh, these are the some problems that they face. There are so many problems. These are actually uh, causing the depression, the frustration among youths in our, uh, our area. Next slide, please. So as a youth, I am looking forward to bringing some real change by sharing my knowledge and some advanced techniques that I have learned from uh, different type of workshops or my academic background. And also I am learning from them the local adaptation techniques and encouraging them to implement all the local adaptation techniques that they have already. So the first one I am trying to introduce is rainwater harvesting, which is very effective and very feasible in how region because the precipitation rate in how region is high. And the second uh, thing I'm trying to introduce in our villages is floating garden. Though floating garden is um, very is a very new concept in Bangladesh, but uh, in so many places floating garden has been implemented successfully. So uh, this could be a uh, alternative way to live for uh, the Howe region people. And I'm also spreading awareness among adolescent girls and women about hygiene and sanitation. The last thing I'm trying to in trying is to increase youth participation participation in different climatic action by collaborating with the village youth organization. I believe that the youths of village can bring new ideas, new thoughts to be implemented in their own region. Our next slide, please. So as a youth while working, I have uh, some advantages like uh, why, uh, when I, whenever I go to the community, vulnerable community, they are more comfortable talking to me and the youth, vulnerable youth that are in our um, uh, region, they are more comfortable also. They can express better as I am also a youth, but there are also some barriers that we as a youth face all over the world, I believe. The first one I want to mention is lack of collaboration. 
I know that there are many youth that are working individually, um, researching individually, but uh, I guess if we collaborate and make an effective bond and uh, like working for one common goal that would bring much more positive change to our country or like other, other vulnerable countries. The second thing I would mention is lack of institutional support. Uh, if anyone is from like background, uh, technical background or want to um, participate in different type of climate action, they are not getting proper institutional support and managing fund to initiate uh, um, action is very tough in our country or in any country, I guess. So here comes the financial barriers. And the last thing I would mention is lack of credibility. We youth are not judged properly, not judged equally as the other partners um, in different type of climate, climate actions. So in SDG 13, it is stated that urgent climate action is needed. I believe that uh, if youth like me and youth like Joey and Sarif and from all over the world, if we come together, share our knowledge and uh, work, as a, work as a group with a common goal, we can bring the changes. We can do a lot more creative climate action in this, uh, in this world. So uh, these are everything from my side. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anika. That was an excellent insight of the Howe region, and rightly so, that youth are struggling. And I think with the specific goal in mind, I think for each specific sector of the SDGs, we can help each other out. And with that notion and idea, we would like to hear from you, whoever is present today in this session, that what changes we can bring about to help this youth who are trying to bring about positive change in their particular community or in the society. So, um, Sakib Bhai. Hi, sorry. I think my things were lagging a bit. It's okay. So we have been, uh, people are joining in. Um, so um, as we were saying, maybe perhaps if we do this as, as uh, open discussion so that it allows for a lot of more people to give in some input, what we would recommend is that if you are making some comments, um, please try to turn on your video. I know for a lot of people, the internet bandwidth or equipment might not be right, but please do try and so at least people can see when you're making some comments. And for quite a lot of the other participants, if you're comfortable doing so, please raise your hand so that we can take some inputs from you. You can maybe make a few comments. If you have any questions for our youth speakers as well, feel free to uh, raise your hand and we'll call on you for that. And if you're not comfortable opening your mic or you're not able to do so, then please also uh, write on the chat box and we'll try and uh, incorporate those into our slides and into our notes going forward. So as we just heard about the SDG5, what we were trying to think in terms of uh, when we were designing the session is as we're sort of looking at uh, completing the SDGs, having as much progress done within the agenda, getting all the goals and indicators to be met, as Adnan mentioned in the very opening, we have about nine years left in being able to complete those. We have a very short time frame in, uh, in goals that are not being achieved at all, or any progress hasn't been done over the last few years anyways. But then there's also a little bit of time for us to be able to do things a little bit better, even if the goals are relatively on track. In certain matters, you might see in certain SDGs, there are relatively on track, there's still time to be able to make those things uh, a little bit better. How can we uh, really make an impact in those areas? So if you look up on the slides here, um, I don't know whether we need to make it a bit bigger for everybody. Thank you. So what, we're, what we'd like to do is, uh, as our youth speakers have gone through three of the SDGs that we find most pertinent for this session. So SDG five for now, maybe if we could have a bit of a discussion, if people would like to come in, we were sort of thinking about having a little bit of discussion about how we can make these uh, issues a little bit more youth friendly, make it a bit more inclusive for youth to come through. So in particular for SDG five, what are some of the ways that people might be able to advise us, give us some tips and tricks 
uh, ask us a few questions about how to advocate for SDG5 and make it a bit more youth inclusive. So if there's any thoughts about that, maybe I'd ask people in the group to have a little think about that. And again, as our youth speakers mentioned, quite a lot of the challenges that they're facing at the community level, working at the grassroots, living in the communities and advocating for these uh, SDG indicators and these goals. What are some of the challenges that maybe you are facing? There's quite a lot of first people in the room that I can see here that possibly are uh, working within the communities themselves, either as part of organizations or within community groups yourself. So maybe if you'd like to share a little bit about some of the challenges that you're going through, and again, uh, there are quite a lot of youth I can see. I know a few of the people in the group. So I can see there's quite a lot of youth yourselves who are very active. I know you're quite uh, a lot of you are engaged in various different activities. So maybe if you let us or even the rest of the group know a little bit about what are some of the advantages that you're finding working with other youth groups and other youth communities. What are some of the ways that you're able to really be a bit more flexible, a bit more innovative and a bit more creative? So. In that uh, respect, maybe if I will look at the chat list, I'm not seeing any hands being raised as yet, but again, maybe if you're taking some time to collect your thoughts, I see Dr. Prabal, perhaps maybe you'd like to come in. Oh, thank you. I am Prabal Bura from uh, Ipsha Chittagong, Bangladesh. Uh, we are working on climate change and uh, relocation of climate displaced people, and also community engagement even for raise the voice of climate change people for demanding their rights and advocacy with government. So uh, as we a community engagement event, we are organizing on different human chain, uh, memorandum distribution and memorandum letter to uh, administration, your administration. So youth are the main uh, uh, key point of Bangladesh and uh, uh, the backbone of Bangladesh uh, depends on youth engagement. So if uh, we are trying to uh, linkage with youth for uh, engagement on different code like human chain for protection, sustainable protection of the demanding embankment and also uh, rehabilitation for river shock affected or uh, climate uh, cycle affected people for sustainable re rehabilitation. So in uh, we are uh, trying to engage in, uh, in people, youth people, with community people for uh, advocacy in Ubudara level uh, for uh, raise their voice against their different social security strategy for uh, young people. At that time, uh, as an organization, we, we are uh, uh, focusing on youth for demanding sustainable rights echo with the displaced people or climate affected people, we are trying to engage with youth and uh, community people because youth are the uh, most, uh, most, uh, most strong power for uh, raise their voice. But community people who are remote people in how area or coast area are not uh, able to. So uh, we are trying to engage of youth people for uh, demanding the, uh, uh, showing their knowledge of uh, exp uh, experience to the relevant stakeholder. So if we take any program with uh, youth people, we must focus on also what demand on community people. If the community people able to raise the voice to youth people, youth people will uh, distributing the uh, knowledge, distributing their uh, power to uh, read memorandum letter, or any other advocacy issue they have here to write a stakeholder for, uh, uh, for demanding their voice. And they secure uh, right way and uh, if the right way of the voice ensure to the relevant stakeholder, the program will be successful and uh, rights of uh, climate change affected or disaster affected people. Uh, Securely, uh, slightly uh, focused to the right people, and the program is implemented successfully. So, thank you, Dr. Prabal. I, I, I would again. like to maybe come back to you because we have a small bit of a discussion that we have in terms of trying to help youth groups think about what are the relevant yeah. stakeholders. So, maybe after I've get taken a few more interventions, I'll come back to you if you could maybe pinpoint a few of the stakeholders that you feel are vital 
in terms of youth engagements and policy engagements that they should be engaging with. But thank you so much yeah. for your intervention. Thank I feel you. my colleague has tried to capture a few of your points. If there's anything additional, please do feel free to uh, raise your hand or put those in the chat. Uh, anybody else that wants to come in at the moment? I'm not seeing any hands raised, so I'd hate to call on people by name. But I, I do know quite a lot of you personally, so I will call you by name. So you <laughs> please raise your hand before I do so. Yes, we have a hand. That's the host. Hi, um, okay. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Salman Saifullah. I work at the International Center for Climate Change and Development under the Youth Program and Climate Finance Program. So um, I'd like to address um, the question on how we can get a better engagement of youth in terms of climate change and un understanding development. Uh, one thing that I always try and emphasize on when I speak about youth is that uh, we must try and take youth as rather than a voluntary um, action than an incentivized action. Um, because currently vo youth voluntary inclusion is becoming a cliche. Uh, people take in youth because A, they're easy, uh, easy people to work with. They, they, they don't ask for much and that's leading to a bit of degradation towards encouragement. So I feel that if we could give certain sense of ownership towards the youth that if you come work with us, you're gaining experience. You come with work with us, you're gaining um, connectivity. You can get, get networking. And that allows for better youth inclusion in terms of development and in terms of LGG goal accomplishment. That's how I feel. And the other thing that, I, that I'd like to bring to the table is that youth are usually brought in as a so sort of a tick box exercise, like a feeling the quota that, I, that the organization or the program has quote unquote youth involved, but in rather it's just on pen and paper. We must be able to give the youth uh, recognition and voice that they require to actually hold a stake at the table. So I feel that that's something that we could look into. Thank you, Shohel. You jumped the gun a little bit because the, that one would be more relevant on the SDG 13, but I hope my colleagues that are working on that one, they've uh, gone ahead and taken some notes and included that as well. But thank you for your intervention. So again, I, I feel that there might be a lot of people that might resonate with the final point where you're working with a lot of youth groups or again, your youths yourselves working in a lot of stakeholder engagement and workshops or so, but then it just feels like it's more of a sort of stakeholder tick boxing as they do, you know, did you consult everybody? Yes, we have a bunch of youth there. They were in the room, they heard everything we said, but not really anything that they could really engage with. So maybe that, that's something that uh, resonates with a lot more people in the group. If somebody would like to come in with the point of that, how, how do you think you might be able to uh, include a lot more youth more engagingly? give them a bit more participatory uh, uh, space within a platform, getting them to give in a bit more of their inputs. If anybody would like to come in with a few uh, points or anything that you're thinking out loud. I realize we have a lot of Bangali participants and it is quite late in Bangladesh, but still. Most of them are from Bangladesh. I observed that quite a lot of them are. Yeah. So any any early comments uh, or anything? Just to Feel free to come in with some sorry. of the other SDGs. Please. Sorry, Adam. I, I'm lagging. Go ahead. No, just reiterating your point. Um, any entry points? It would be lovely to hear from you. Um, um, for example, the challenges. Yeah, Arusa, please. Sorry, um, I'm the one taking notes, but I'll go since uh, the first question hasn't really been answered. Um, so uh, the first question, which is on the board that you can see is that is advocacy youth friendly and inclusive in terms of gender uh, inclusion. So um, being part of this uh, group, uh, what uh, from personal experience, I would like to say that um, Bangladesh hasn't reached a point yet where I think um, advocacy is youth friendly and inclusive because, um, you know, uh, besides just like counting a few organizations, I think most organizations still have the, uh, have a very bureaucratic uh, way of um, operation where um, 
I believe like um, my uh, colleagues Saki Bhaya and like my colleague Shohal Bhaya has mentioned, you know, like the ownershipness, you know, um, giving youth a chance really, because I have heard in so many places that, you know, they're taking youth advocates in, but you know, what do they do? They just sit there and take meeting minutes. But I feel like we have so much to offer because we see the world as it is today. And, you know, we don't, I'm not, of, of course, I'm not saying that um, uh, the people who are uh, older than us, they, of course, have, they might have more knowledge and experience. However, I feel like because we have a perspective of today's generation, um, I think um, it we, we need to hear more and we actually need to have that mindset that, okay, even if this person is uh, this many years younger than me, they still might have a better idea or a good idea so that is one and in terms of gender inclusion I think you know um I don't it it, it will be a really big discussion um I feel like uh being a girl and volunteering as a youth has a lot of um barriers uh personally I haven't faced any um because my family has been very supportive of um me volunteering for any social cause or anything uh relevant to my um likes or dislikes or hobbies but I know a lot of people who are my friends who, uh, who weren't allowed to go and volunteer at a certain place because that person was a girl and they needed to go there alone. So, uh, and I'm, I'm just saying all of this in terms of Bangladesh still. So um, please feel free. I would really like to know um, from other countries what's the situation or seen there. Thank you, Arusa. Uh, just uh, before we get to you, Khadija, one second. I know there's a couple of our colleagues in the call here at the moment that work on more sort of the global level platforms. So maybe uh, some of the points that Arusa just mentioned about raising advocacy at the global levels, what are some of the ways that you're working on really trying to make those platforms and those spaces a little bit more inclusive for youth? How you do you think about engaging youth more globally? Because that's a much bigger task as well. How do you get so many different countries and so many different youth communities to come together and raise their voices together in one sort of uh, coherent manner at the global level? So maybe if you can have a little think about that, I'll get to you. I see a hand raised by Khadija. Um, hello, I'm Khadija and um, I'm the founder of Women View. Um, so we basically work with uh, surrounding gender and with youth. Um, all of our volunteers are youth. Um, so what I feel that we face, in, particularly in Bangladesh, and especially wor uh, while working around surrounding gender, is that we want, like we always want more girls and women to come in and work um, in these matters. And in honestly, there's this quota thing as well. Uh, but what we fail to ensure is their security um, and their safety. So what I've, I have personally faced is that while working surrounding gender, you, get, you face a lot of threats. And it's not only about gender. Like whenever you're working as a youth advocate, uh, whenever you raise, raise, raise your voice against particular things, there are always people who will not agree with you. Um, and that way, what happens is that they, the, the, uh, especially girls, they are girls and women in Bangladesh, they get uh, very discouraged. They feel threatened. So I feel one of the things that we have to make sure, um, we have to ensure is their security when we are, uh, because nowadays we go on and um, try to um, preach that we have female members, we have female, like, we have like women uh, working for us and with us, but we do not um, ensure their safety. So I feel one of the things that we need to focus on uh, is ensuring their safety from now on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Khadiza. That, that's a very good point in that. And as well, uh, as you can see a little bit of the boxes at the bottom, I think one of those uh, uh, topics that you just raised is something that we would focus as a priority in terms of youth inclusion, because that's that's uh, one of the things that has come up in quite a lot of the work that we've been doing in terms of whether the youth feel safe to be able to raise their voices, and particularly for women and young girls, whether the, the platforms are secure, whether the, the societal mindset is enough for them to be able to raise their voices without any repercussions. So I think that's something that is uh, something that resonates with a lot of youth activities that happen. So thank you for bringing that forward. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. So um, if there is anybody with another point, any other feedbacks? 
anybody from our global networks, perhaps they want to talk a little bit about how they're bringing the advocacy issues up front, making them more inclusive, a bit more participatory. Anybody with some youth community experiences, perhaps you'd like to come in with that. I see my host is taking the hosting duties quite well. Would you like to come in again, Shoel? Hi. Um, I'm also part of the um, youth engagement program under the Penn State Sustainability Institute and the Club of Rome, where we have recently started to do this program of trying to communicate and form a network of a global youth platform where we have people coming in from global north, global south, um, and we are trying to tackle the aspect of inclusionism through, through diversity and how we can go about it. Uh, the one major aspect that we found out is that um, include, trying to include everyone in cannot be a generalized aspect that we require more youth, we require more women, we require more um, other gender. But on that accord, it requires a bit more bespoke and so, um, soft hand to address that because not every situation is going to be the same. Not every situation is going to be that easy. Therefore, it is it is always required to have a certain sense of um, approach when inclusionism is talked about, especially in youth, youth and policy and climate change, and especially SDGs. So that is something that we're trying to bridge where, where with the global youth and as well as global policymakers. Thank you, Shoal. So some global insights. Again, I, I know there are others, so please do let us know what, what are the thinkings that are happening within the, the global networks, because I know quite a lot of those ones have been working for quite an extensive number of years. And this is an issue that is something that they've been tackling from day one. So then this would be something that we'd really like to be able to bring in. How do we filter in these local experiences going up through the national to the regional, as well as the, the global levels as well. I see a hand from Pippa, Pippa Scott. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm UK based um, and just wanted to share like a personal experience. I don't work a lot in, in advocacy, but I do work in water and sanitation um, quite a lot as a, as a consultant. And I just wanted to share, a, you know, a, I'm here like as an observer and, and learning, um, but I also wanted to share a personal um, experience, which was in the last year I've worked with um, youth and I can honestly say um, that it's the, like recognizing the value of the youth voice, recognizing the, the difference in perspective and the strength of perspective and being able to be challenged and the impatience and not accepting the status quo and you know, recognizing where I'd fallen into a status quo um, or recognize the kind of, you know, I'd, I'd fallen into to a structure and having someone um, with a different energy and a different perspective um, engaged, that kind of lived, lived experience for me um, has really transformed my kind of um, lobbying for, for youth inclusion um, and, and really, really valuing that voice. Um, so I guess it's just a kind of uh, like a celebration and you know what more support needed from is anyone who's genuinely recognize the value of the youth um, and the youth voice to continue to celebrate that and lobby for it and to make sure that it's included in a really kind of lived experience way, um, I think might be able to take us where there are these barriers of tokenism versus actual inclusion to really kind of stand up for that inclusion um, of meaningful voice. Thank you. Thank you, Pippa. Um, I think, I think that also resonates. Sorry, Adnan, do you want to come in? No, no, it's okay. Um, so now I just to personally thank people, but just to carry on that conversation, since we're talking about SDG 6 here as well. So we from Waterade Bangladesh, we're working um, on uh, water sanitation and hygiene. But as we are trying to discuss here, there are multiple issues regarding uh, in, involving youth in those particular areas. Could you just um, share an experience from your end um, what is the scenario like in achieving um, or targeting youth on sharing the knowledge on AZG6 in the UK? Um, <clears throat> sure. Um, yeah, okay, seeing so we're on to SDG6 um, here. Um, so very recently, actually, being in the UK, um, there was, there's been a focus on 
where I live um, in, in Scotland um, with pollution of water bodies of sewers. So kind of un, untreated sewers going, uh, untreated sewage going into the rivers, which isn't something normally I work in, in places where there aren't sewers. So this is um, a little bit new to my kind of field of expertise as well. Um, and I've, it's just been incredible sitting with younger people at the table and this, the, the demand for climate justice is so fierce and so unaccepting of the status quo. Um, and I think not being stuck in the rigidity of how things are or how things have to be or um, um, the timelines of procurement and infrastructure. And it's, you know, it's really easy to get to get kind of tied up in, in how slow things move and, and things like that. And, and for me, it's definitely that the voice that is coming is um, one of injustice and one of in there's there's an urgency and and I you know I there there are times in the meetings that we're having you know trying to have these negotiations where I'm you know purposefully bringing that voice strong and loud and being like don't listen to don't listen to the so-called experts in the room these are the this is the voice you need to hear and just just keep maintaining giving that platform for the demand for change um but it's it's i'm i'm loving it it's such a it's you know it's it's something i've kind of always been supportive of but never had that kind of lived experience um until recently and and now it's something that i would actively and eagerly seek seek in in any kind of work that i'm i'm doing thank you so much Sakibai, if you want to continue yeah Thank you. Uh, just to one of the other points that uh, Pippa had mentioned about how to break out of that tokenism. I think that also uh, it relates with quite a lot of what we've been uh, talking in some of the other sessions. If uh, some of you have been attending some of the CBA sessions on locally led adaptation and the principles of that, about how, how do we make these um, interactions and these collaborative actions more sustained. And then again, in terms of to, uh, sort of breaking out of these tick box exercises where we have just a token youth representative and a youth voice per sort of agenda item or a meeting that we do. I think the sustained action, making sure that we're being collaborative, not just when the events are happening, not just when a big sort of global movement is uh, moving forward, but also making sure that these uh, collaborative actions and these uh, interactions that we're having with different communities and youth groups are sustained, something that we do all the time between one meeting to the other, between one campaign to the next, making sure that these sustained actions carry forward. So I think that that's also something that's quite important. So um, any, any other reflections on any of the other uh, SDGs that we had? Um, I believe Zarif had a question about how we can make, you know, sort of the awareness uh, campaigns on SDG six a little bit more relevant. So as, as Pippa was talking about some of the activities that uh, they've been doing in the UK about SDG six and youth inclusion, any, any thoughts from other people about how we could be addressing those issues and making those a bit more inclusive? Dr. Prabhul, I see your mic. Uh, inclusion is most <coughs> highlighting word now at present. I, I want to share about the, if we included the personally disabled people in the main areas for youth engagement, uh, because uh, youth, uh, Passionate people, uh, most of uh, many people of many youth peoples are now passionate disability, uh, disabled people, and government also uh, trying to uh, implement different programs uh, for passionate disabilities. And presently, um, you, uh, disabled person are mostly uh, IT sectors are experienced IT sector through mobile, digital mobile digital laptop and other uh, uh, accessible dictionary. So, and that uh, youth people who are who are disabled, they are mostly dependent on digitalized uh, system. So uh, the uh, main priority areas with inclusion for personally disabled also included. Yeah. And, uh, and we are also hearing that uh, youth has the power. Uh, we are working uh, on training on climate change issue. Uh, through online, uh, and they have focused. We are 
and in some program they are focusing on their demonstration through tree plantation, uh, some embankment uh, reconstruction. They are working with the government department, joint work, and uh, sometimes they are working on roof garden mm -hmm. for practicing. So if uh, practically they will achieve this uh, target, they will uh, implement this, they will be uh, organization will be more trust on youth and uh, more of uh, many of should all, all organization of Bangladesh should focusing on youth engagement and youth, youth development related program for climate action uh, you know, within soon. It should be urgently required. Thank you, Dr. Babul. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to pick on one point. Uh, sorry, Adnan, would you like to go? Yeah, sorry. I can't see your camera I for some reason. Kind of keep interrupting you. Um, just in terms of inclusion, um, for SDG six, it's particularly hard. For example, um, accessible latrine for the person of disability. There's so many problems in the context of Bangladesh, um, but we're trying from water to figure it out. But however, uh, when it comes to inclusion, it's becoming. I agree, it's becoming a buzzword. But when you trickle down to the grassroots level, when you're trying to figure out when you're singling out different people, different groups of people, um, having a set bit of solutions for each is becoming difficult. So that's why maybe some communities get left out, but at the same time, we're trying to figure it out. So um, excellent point there in terms of um, bringing in youth for different sectors. Yeah, um, this is also mentionable that I want to show that recently Bangladesh A2I program and it's winning the UNESCO WSIS, WSIS prize for inclusion, uh, ensuring uh, SIHR for youth on personally disabled, SIHR rights. It is accessible, uh, digitalized, uh, uh, digitalized practice on SIHR rights for personally disabled and worldwide it is now, uh, Highlighting and Bangladesh achieved the championship recently. So, you, uh, you have to be made in past. Uh, that's, good to know. that's good to know. Um, yeah. Sakibai, on your point, please. Um, just on that note, then perhaps uh, if I can get people to sort of think a little bit about uh, inclusivity of youth in SDG 13 or any of the other points that have come up so far. Um, in the meantime, just to pick up on a little bit of uh, what Dr. Pablo mentioned about the, the new age that we're in right now, uh, dealing with a lot of the pandemic issues, everything's starting to become a digital. As we can see, this, this conference right now is digital, otherwise it would have been in person here in Dhaka as originally intended. So again, there, there's quite a lot of youth uh, people here. Maybe they'd like to speak a little bit about uh, some of the challenges maybe or some of the advantages that you've been having because of things moving into more of a digital forum in some of the activities that you're doing, in perhaps some of the local communities that you're working with, are, are these moves towards digital arenas becoming more challenging or you find it more advantageous for you? Perhaps maybe if people could come in with a little bit of comments on those. And as Adnan mentioned uh, about climate actions in your area, speak may perhaps a little bit, taking us towards uh, SDG 13, what are some of the activities that you're seeing as impacts in your areas? What are some of the ways that maybe the youth are being engaged in taking initiatives in your areas on climate actions? Sure, um, Perhaps I've given quite a lot of thinking points. So yeah, Adnan, please um, take over. If I could ask Vincent, um, since you're our global participant here, if you're there, if you could share your insight. Sorry, I'm calling out. <laughs> or anyone else for that matter, yeah. I think we have a few here as well. If I had to call out names, sorry, Zainab, are you in? Hi, so yeah, maybe I'll share something on Quest 16. Sorry for the background noise at my end, I'm not very quite place. No worries. Uh, so maybe I'll share something about the Quai, which is a conference of youth organized every year before COP. Uh, so this year, since everything is going digital and remote, so um it's very difficult for the whole uh, conference secretariat to organize everything uh, so uh, looking into the possible opportunities which we have again we are going at some part we're going like organizing things virtually and then some things are again happening on ground 
Um, in addition to that, maybe I'll share some uh, general comments on how uh, we can make youth participation more inclusive. It could be, uh, we, we have to identify how we can provide the meaningful, meaningful opportunities to youth and, and how we can make uh, the youth participation more uh, inclusive manner through a bottom-up approach because um, in the global south or maybe the south region countries we have seen that there's a very common approach of the things being dictated by the higher authorities and uh, young people don't have any say uh, in the policy making or they are not being incorporated in the planning process so it's very important to involve them through a bottom-up approach and also to bridge that particular gap between knowledge and action through capacity building. Because willingness is out there, people are ready to do their part and to add uh, their part in the community, but they don't know how. So it's very important to bridge this particular gap through their capacity building, training, mutual knowledge sharing, and activities like that. And I believe it's very also very important to invite them to uh, and to listen to them what they're saying and to incorporate their voices in the policy dialogue and the whole process so that uh, they don't feel like it's a very tokenistic approach and they feel like being part of that particular process. Uh, and, and all these, the points which I've mentioned uh, could be incorporated into the process through a proper uh, institutionalization because uh, the things way, the, th the way the things are happening right now, there is no proper framework things are not institutionalized in our governments. So it's very important to provide them a, a platform to acknowledge their work, which is being done and to provide them with the right opportunities through which uh, we can uh, foster this dialogue between a layman, a youth and the organization who, who are working on maybe SDG 13 or uh, other SDGs and the whole you know, climate action process. Uh, so these are like my two cents. Thank you, Zainab. I think that was very informative. And I think uh, I'll have a similar ask of you and maybe give you a couple of minutes to think and then come back to us later about the, the box at the sort of bottom of the screen there, about what are some of the more um, key stakeholders, let's say, some of the key actors that you would think, at least at, at sort of organizing the national and the regional and global levels, that you should be sort of targeting, as you say, in being institutionalizing their, themselves within the national planning or even international treaties. What are some of the key actors that perhaps we should be looking towards as supportive or people that we should really be taking our voices towards? Uh, so maybe I'll give you some time to think about that. And then uh, either you could write those on the chat or maybe I can circle back and get onto that. Um, are there any other thoughts about anybody else? Uh, anything that we've sort of been discussing? Again, uh, let's, let's be a bit more open about it. We can be about any of the SDGs that we have so far. If you've gotten any sort of feedback from some of the work that you're doing, any of the activities that you've taken, if you'd like to ask a few questions to our um, youth speakers as well, anything, or perhaps our youth speakers themselves, something, some reflections that you're getting now while you're hearing some people in the group, would any of our speakers like to come in and maybe make some comments? I can go in reverse order of the speakers or I can pick by random. Yeah, sorry if you're there, if you could, just reiterate the challenges you are facing in terms of implementing SDG 6 so that our um, other speakers can reflect on it. Thank you so much uh, for giving me floor again. In my experience, uh, the like the first question, the, is advocacy youth friendly and inclusive in terms of gender inclusion? Uh, this is a yes. Um, I faced some problems while doing the wars. Like I remember the, I was uh, going to a household uh, for collecting data for a water related project. I, I was collecting data about their water usage. Like, so that was a war day and I went to a household and I knocked and as there, that was a war day, so no male members were present at that moment. So female members opened the door and when they see me, a male person, they felt a bit shy to share their uh, um, uh, yeah, water usage related or any other related data. They felt shy to talk with me. The, that day I targeted, uh, I think I would uh, 
I, as long as I remember, I targeted, I would collect 30 data from the different households. And that day, I collected none because most of them were facing the same issue. So, yes, there is a really a trust issue while implementing some yeah, projects. Thank you, Zarif. I, I think that is also something that uh, not just in, in the sort of gender clash between youth and perhaps as a researcher taking data, collecting some information or so, but I think it overall, that was something that was, again, drawing back from some of our experiences of uh, one of the other sessions on youth about how the youth get credibility. How do we build the trust of the system for the youth to be engaged in that? And again, I think that sort of loops back to something that Pippa was saying about making that a bit more sustained. It, it's be very difficult to build that sort of trust in system, breaking the sort of gender barriers, breaking the sort of youth and seniority barriers, if you're only doing it as a one-off activity. And I think, you know, building that trust takes time, something that you have to be doing over time sustainably, doing it at every opportunity that you're able to give, and then giving platform for people to really, you know, build up their capacities and give their inputs in a, in a fair manner. And I think that that sort of builds up the trust over time. So I think that that's a good point, sorry, thank you. Um, should we ask one of the other speakers while maybe some people are getting their thinking together? Yes, uh, Joey, would you like to come in? Yeah. Joey, if you're there, if you could share. Um, while working in, as an indigenous woman, uh, the things that mainly I face, there, there are not enough data for the indigenous people in Bangladesh. And as it is added that the youth ideas are not taken seriously and become and being a woman and also that added indigenous women in Bangladesh and the security and equal opportunity are, are not presented the way it should. That's what I really face when I try to work or try to collect the data. So that's that's the point of view of mine. Thank you, Joey. I think, I think again, a chronic problem in almost a lot of the developing country context is the lack of data. There, there are lots of places where this data does, does not exist. There's a lot of places where perhaps the data exists, but it's behind some firewall or left in somebody's shelf that isn't disseminated publicly. And then again, uh, again, as people that work in these projects, researchers or project managers and NGOs, we have to do the thing from scratch again. So it, it really, you're not able to build on the good practices. You sort of have to go back into um, doing things from scratch. So thank you for bringing that forward. Uh, Dr. Prabhu, I'll come to you. Maybe just uh, if I give the floor to Anika to maybe have some uh, yeah, the, uh, feedback from her and oh, then we can come you. back to you. Uh, I uh, Actually, we, I, I focus on SDG 10, that's global inequality, SDG 10. It also related on climate change and also for Bangladesh because people having coastal area and Hawaii area are, are facing uh, in, uh, inequality, which are also related to climate change. And we have uh, some time in research work, and I am also work on global inequalities and climate displacement or climate change affected people. So youth also can also uh, work on reducing inequality issues uh, inequality issue for the uh, future and uh, the trust uh, of trust of the people is also a most important issue uh, in at my experience in Chittagong Hill Tract of living in Chittagong Hill Tract I saw that the trust between indigenous people and uh, other Bengali people and non-indigenous people is mainly a factor for not able to hear data because the trust is main things as, uh, as I experienced my, uh, and also in the race, uh, if the youth, uh, the people who are talked about the youth people, uh, the, the data is not as actually measured. But if he take uh, the community, local community people, he can able to uh, real data. So trust, uh, trust of community people and trust also indigenous and Bengal is also the main factor for not obtaining real data. In, uh, in any area or any in Chittagong Hill track is the main reason for fact problem. Thank you. That's that's quite right. Thank you, Dr. Prabal. I think 
uh, exactly the one of the issues is that you know if you're sort of lacking the essential yeah. foundations of trust and credibility then it, it becomes a bit difficult to sort of really rely on the on the data that you might be collecting even if people are responsive and they're saying something it, it's something that you then have to keep revising and again it comes back to the issue of whether we're really able to build on the good successes of projects and research that we that's have my, or are we having to do things from scratch that's thank my you work so much experience in the hard to reach post area and we always uh, give the uh, no, uh, give the information to community leaders then he helped to me to visit it in nearby area who will be benefited who will be victim this is the main point at first we build the trust of community people then we will go to the field there thank you dr baba I, i know we'll come to anika so just before i do i'll give you and zainab a sort of the task that i would like in case of if you remember just sort of talking about the key stakeholders so please have a little think about that and maybe put that into the chat so that we can uh, appropriately put those in the notes of the rapporteurs um anika would you like to come in Anika, uh, I'm not sure if it's my internet or Anika's. Yes, no, my think... yes, a uh, very like internet problem is like tolerating me okay, a lot. Okay. No worries. Go ahead. I missed a lot of things in between. By the way, I uh, I, I have already mentioned that. Um, am i audible yeah yeah anika go yes, ahead yes we can hear you go ahead as i've already mentioned that uh, i'm working with the youth of how uh, how area so uh, i felt like the real scenario of those remote areas are not coming out uh, they are they are actually suffering more and the uh, mainly the girls in there like they are literally forced to marriage uh, which which i think um should become out and uh, also um as they are uh, not able to i think we can come back to anika i think she is having i think she dropped out yeah um so we have members from women um i think khadija is here so just the, i want to throw a question like for the discussion so there are a lot of challenges i think um as joy mentioned like inclusivity is hard in terms of including indigenous women in um in terms of achieving certain um issues or sol solving certain issues so khadija if you could just help us out on understanding how your organization is playing a crucial part in achieving such problems if you're there yeah i am hi um so um i have not particularly worked with indigenous uh, the indigenous community or indigenous women as of yet but what we are focusing on right now um is that uh we we kind of gave up on trying to teach um older people how to uh provide a more inclusive society that's like that's really hard for us so what we are focusing on is work, we're working with children um we teach them inclusivity we teach them about like uh how there are no gender roles um we teach them about other uh respecting um other basically other genders and how um they could basically we try to create an environment where they grow up to be more inclusive in nature um so i feel that if we can actually focus on this the younger generation that we have right now uh, particularly starting with children then we probably can um tackle the situation in the future uh, and that could that would create like a better environment for the youth and for basically for everyone so i feel that um it's 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 never too late um and it is going to so changes take time uh, it's going to take a lot of time so we should focus we should at least start now and focusing and start focusing on children we should start start teaching them all the things that we want in the future so that maybe that way we can have a, a more inclusive environment for everyone so yeah 
Thank, Thank you, you so much. I think uh, it's really important. At the same time, yeah, it will take time, but hopefully in the next nine years, we can bring about positive changes in those localities. Um, so, Saki Bhai, um, I think you had given to... And then I think Anika's just come back, so maybe if we could yeah. uh, just give it to her for a couple of minutes to finish her thought. Sure. Um, Anika, the floor is yours. Uh, um, I don't know if she's dropped out again. Anika, can you hear us? I think internet issues, it's fine. Oh, um, I think she's having some issues, sorry. So um, just uh, before we sort of go to the wrap up, I think and then maybe if I can ask uh, Zainab and Dr. Prabhu, if they'd like to give us a bit of inputs into the key stakeholders that our, our youth participants in the call today should sort of aim for. So uh, Dr. Prabhu, if I can give you a minute or two and Zainab, I'll come to you for a minute or two. <laughs> Thank you. I want to about that key stakeholders, uh, key stakeholders I, I focus on at in union in, 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 in position then Upojaga uh, administration. Upojaga administration will be the main local uh, government points for uh, for taking the uh, information of field level activities. So uh, if we uh, first first highlighting the uh, highlighting the information or raise the program to Upojaga administration, they will uh, they will uh, send the news to uh, district administration or central government. And also um, sometimes sometimes. Uh, there are some government department in Upazaga level, uh, Upazaga level. They will, uh, and we also some uh, uh, sending the information to that uh, office. And also sometimes uh, Ministry of Disaster Manage Disaster and Relief, Ministry of Dis uh, we sometimes uh, send the information to them or uh, and them and Ministry of other information like. A Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change, also the key stakeholder for us uh, uh, for uh, taking the information, taking the note on act according to the circumstances. But if we want to the uh, youth engagement, we the Ministry of Youth also the main key stakeholders because uh, there are uh, some initiative for uh, funding for youth in the field mm -hmm. level. Uh, which is also always unspent for the unspent in uh, Upazaga. I observed that uh, Upazaga uh, Youth Department says that we have a fund, but we cannot utilize uh, because uh, because of some uh, initiate uh, lacking of initiative. So if we uh, if we uh, if we establish the ring cases with uh, relevant department uh, mm -hmm. or government department or other NGO sectors, uh, uh, NGO sectors like you, I and the different organization according to the condition, it will, uh, the, the, uh, the policies, the uh, demand will be fruitful, uh, fruitful and people will uh, take necessary uh, facilities for solve the crisis or solve the problem. Thank so you. I so I, I, again, you. again, just sort of uh, concisely, maybe perhaps uh, one thing that I would advise for our youth participants in the call to not only think about sort of the national level ministerial departments, but also looking at some of the local government institutions, okay, yeah. maybe some of the district and regional ones that you're sort of more able to sort of uh, go and approach municipal or corporations or uh, city and corporations. There are also one, I also saw about that there are 155 social security strategies in Bangladesh well, main uh, most of the things are uh, having uh, lacking of information to youth people who are how they got the uh, facilities of the social security studies because Indian police mm -hmm. also distributed so many social security studies like youth uh, they are widow fear or social development fear, but it also the due to corruption due to uh, problem of the local administration it will, uh, but effective door communication should be required. Not mm -hmm. should be. because uh, Thank you, sir. we sometimes we, yes sometimes uh, you know but also said the certificate 
to people, but this was unknown. Thank you. So that that actually Thank also you. brings up a very important point about certifications and permits. So I, yeah. I think I think there's quite a lot that we need to be doing in, in collaboration with public sector at all different yeah. levels. So that that's a very important stakeholder to be looking at. So maybe just a couple of minutes to Zainab about sort of engaging with stakeholders. What are what are you guys seeing as sort of important stakeholders and networks that you're trying to build? Maybe if you could uh, do it in about a minute or two, and then I'll hand over to Adnan. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So. Uh, so some of the stakeholders which I could think on top of my head would be the ministry. They could be like Ministry of Climate Change or maybe the local and provincial EPAs, uh, depending on the context of the government, depending on the country again. And then the local governments are very important because again, ministries are not working locally in the region. So local government provide a context and provide a framework for whatever action we are going to take. Uh, the formal and informal youth groups then who are better connected with the people and especially the youth groups across the country they are very important to uh, to be reached out and to be involved in the process ngos cso's and think tanks are again very important because they bridge a gap where we need research and development tasks uh, they are better uh, connected and they are you know they are they better know the problems of the local area because they are working at the grassroots level and they are better connected at the grassroots level with the local people uh, it's very important not to ignore the entrepreneurs especially the social entrepreneurs because uh, they are the people who identify the opportunities available uh, to us to the governments to take action and to uh, you know um, to work on those particular gaps which have not been identified earlier Indigenous groups are very important because uh, they are the main, I would say, the knowledge holders, uh, which could again make the process very powerful if it's done in a right way. And then the local community is again not to be ignored because it, the local community particularly provides the context for every action we are going to take. Uh, it's very important to involve them in a process. Uh, so I think these are some of the stakeholders, which I'll also share in a chat for your reference. Thank you so much, Zainab. I think that was also very informative for people to sort of have their thinking around when they're sort of looking at what, what different activities they would like to be designing. So I think that's really, really informative. Thank you so much. You. Uh, with that, I think our discussion part portion is sort of over. If there are any final comments or so, uh, if people would like to maybe put that into the chat and I'll hand over to Adnan for now. Thank you. Now, before quickly going there, Zarif, your hand is up if you want to share anything. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you for giving me the floor. And I would like to add a couple of um, points before we wrap up the challenges we face uh, that I faced in person, that people don't take things seriously. Like they know that the water is limited, but they don't take this seriously. They hear, hear the thing that, yes, okay, we have fixed this, okay. Then they forward, they move on and so on. And again, they also like to blame others. Like in this project, the, in my leak tap project, uh, when I tell someone that you have to fix the leak taps for the future, they like to blame that the authority installed the wrong tap. Why did they do it in the first place? So self-initiative is less for, from their part. And the fact is that water is limited. In this case, the people who has the less education, like the slum people, they know the value of water. That's the thing I see, but yes, they, they don't know that the fact that water is limited. So thank you. I'd like to that thing. Yeah, I would, thank you, Zarif. No, it's really important. Uh, mindsets and people's actions are really necessary uh, to bring about positive change. It's almost midnight in Bangladesh. Thank you for um, speaking with us so far till now. So just to conclude, we had some really good discussions and really good points coming in for the three different SDGs we presented today. I think with those particular insights, we'll be taking forward on our drawing boards from both ECAD and WaterAid on how to better improve the different um, issues or challenges we're facing for different areas of Bangladesh and maybe come up with an inclusive policy response in terms of achieving those particular targets. And with that, thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you to my colleagues at ECAD. Uh, thank you for being patient. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.